but was set straight. The officers who had vehemently opposed the retreat were proved right when seven days after Operation Tiger, most of the 400,000 troops who tried to reinforce the main army group found themselves surrounded and helpless just a few miles west of their original positions. Most had no option but to surrender. A finer bitter blow was that the garrisons of the large fortresses, such as the Hackenberg, were sold down the river. They had held out despite constant German attacks until even after the armistice was signed and only marched out to surrender in order to do so, in writing, by their high command. The normal terms of war allow that troops still bearing arms when an armistice is declared are allowed home to their families and farms. But the defenders of the Maginot Line were sent straight to POW camps in Germany, possibly a point insisted on by Hitler himself, known for spiteful reprisals against anyone who dared defy him. Now began the nightmare of four long years of German occupation. Initially, the victorious Germans had little need of the immense booty they had won in the Maginot Line, but as things deteriorated on the Eastern Front, they began to strip the arms and ammunition from many of the forts and tear out the steel for scrap. The huge generators of Hackenberg were taken to the submarine base at Brest. Many guns went to arm the Atlantic and Channel coast defences against the expected Allied invasion from Britain. By 1944, as Allied bombing flattened their factories in the Reich, manufacturing of vital war materials took place in some of the large forts. At the Hackenberg, components of submarines and aircraft were produced by imported slave labour. But by now, it was clear that the Nazi Empire's days were numbered, as the German army retreated at the Soviet onslaught in the East and the Allied armies in Italy. The long-awaited Allied invasion of Northern Europe took place on June 6, 1944. After initially being confined to a slowly expanding beachhead for weeks, the Allied armies with massive naval and air support burst out across France and the ensuing German retreat eastwards turned for a while into a panic-stricken rout. But as the Allied spearheads approached the borders of Germany, they outran their supplies of fuel, ammunition and food, giving the Nazis once more a chance to rally and organise a final defence of their fatherland on the siege grid line. The western approaches to this extensively fortified region to the east of the Metz area were covered by what had been the reverse side of the Maginot Line. Despite the fact that bunkers had been allowed to fall into disrepair and were manned by small German units acting on their own initiative, Patton's Third Army was to find cracking the Maginot Line just as hard as von Witzleben did four years previously. In particular, Patton's advance was hindered by four 75mm artillery pieces in this, Hackenberg's Block 8. It took an outflanking move by heavy self-propelled guns to finally eliminate this menace. Ironically, the supporting gun emplacements, which would have made this move almost impossible, had been wrecked by the Germans, who used them to try out anti-tank weapons in the war. Massive Allied ground and air superiority ensured that eventually the war moved on, into the heart of Germany, ending almost exactly five years after the shock invasion of France in May 1940. Immediately after the war, some of the larger Maginot Line forts, including the Hackenberg, were refurbished for the French military. Perhaps they thought yet another stand could be made there if the Russians suddenly decided to try to advance westward by conventional means. Or maybe they were considered ideal ready-made nuclear bunkers for a chosen elite if things went badly wrong. Then, in 1964, most of the Maginot forts were shut down and allowed to slowly fall into disrepair. For half a century now, much of the Maginot Line has languished, abandoned. Its rusting turrets and mouldering casemates a brooding reminder of a terrible episode in French history. In this part of the country, the Maginot Line is literally a part of the scenery. Bunkers and turrets seem to pop up in all sorts of places. When many of them were sold off in the 1960s, some farmers bought them to store animal fodder or grow mushrooms. Some were even converted to holiday homes. But great care must be taken by anyone looking around these old structures. Though most of those with access to deep underground tunnels are securely locked, even welded shut, we found this one easy to enter. For once, there were no warning signs. Once inside, and it was pitch dark even in daytime, you only had to walk a yard into a particular room to plunge 150 feet to the flooded main tunnel below. 
Even the guardrails normally present have been removed for scrap, probably by the Germans. A deadly trap for unsuspecting tourists, especially children. Other bunkers have been retained by the military for reasons they might not wish to discuss. Still nuclear shelters, ammunition storage perhaps. Some are used as makeshift homes for the alternative society and some are handy for posting notices. Some enterprising locals, however, noticed there was a growing fascination with the Maginot Line among visitors to the area, especially concerning the larger fortresses. Several of these had been partially restored to their wartime condition. The Hackenberg near Thionville is run by volunteer enthusiasts who offer tourists from all over the world a two-hour conducted tour, including a ride on the electric train which once carried troops and munitions, and on one memorable occasion even King George VI, to his fighting turrets. Among the most numerous foreign visitors are the Germans and the British. Some of them seek the place out specially, many others just happen by, having little idea as to the nature and purpose of the huge fortress. Many of us may well have forgotten the Maginot Line, but it's nice to know that here at Hackenberg, they haven't forgotten us. The plaque reads, in memory of the British Expeditionary Force, 1939 to 40, and to all the garrison and support troops of the Maginot Line. Talking with the benefit of that great luxury, hindsight, many armchair strategists have dismissed the Maginot Line as a ruinous folly. They even imply somehow that it was to blame for the fall of France. They claim that France could have built up several extra armoured divisions or a decent air force with all that money. Well, this is exactly what Russia did do. At the time of Germany's invasion of that vast country, she had several times the number of tanks and aircraft the Germans could put in the field. But since the majority of these had been manufactured in the early 30s, they were obsolete and were shot to pieces in record time by the superbly coordinated German army and air power. Only the immense distances available for retreat and the onset of the terrible Russian winters saved the Soviets from an even more crushing defeat than that inflicted on France. Even the cost of the Maginot Line has been exaggerated. It's true, it was a vast sum, but still only a fraction of the amount needed to build a really modern and effective army and air force. At the time, it was considered a cheap option by the nation's leaders. But it was the training for and practice in modern warfare that the Allies lacked in 1940. Though one or two of their more junior officers, such as Basil Littlehart and Charles de Gaulle, had advocated the use of high-speed armoured warfare, only the Germans had actually embraced this concept, mainly due to Hitler himself backing the few officers who advocated it against the old-fashioned views of their own general staff. And certainly only the Germans, with an army trained, equipped and motivated to a standard far beyond anything the democracies could match for years to come, had had the opportunity to practice this kind of aggressive warfare for real both in the Spanish Civil War and later in Poland. By the time they met the Western Allies, they were masters of the art, and it's unlikely that twice the number of Allied tanks and planes could have stopped them. I read in recently published history that the Maginot Line was a military blunder and that it hardly fired a shot in anger. In another, that the Germans took the Maginot Line forts easily from the reverse side. Such myths have a habit of persisting in the face of true facts. That they are presented as history is an insult to the memory of the thousands of brave Frenchmen who stood fast against the most powerful and efficient army in modern times, until ordered to surrender by their own unworthy high command. It's fitting that this narrative should end at the military cemetery at La Ferte. No one knows exactly the full horror of how these men died. Wounded, shocked, mostly suffocating in the deep gallery of the fortress. One thing is certain, they could not have given more to their country. They helped delay the advance of the German army just as the designers of the Maginot Line intended. It was not their fault that better use was not made at that time by the Allied High Command.